Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Back with another round of questions from my supporters over at Patreon. Uh, yeah, if you want to ask a question, you can add it to a thread over there. However, I'm going to point out that we are currently about five months behind because, well, you know, you don't want to have a hundred questions in a single video, do you? Do you? You would make me do that? Okay, anyway, look, well, let's get started. We're going to start with Adrian Slider, who says, Hey, Scott, thinking about the DART mission, I started to wonder what good it would actually does to perform a burn to slam into an asteroid. While the spacecraft gains velocity, it loses the mass of the propellant itself. Do propellants carry more potential energy than kinetic energy? Then they carry as plain old mass. Okay, so, that, yeah, okay, so here, um, what we're actually talking about is the difference between kinetic energy and momentum. When you are impacting a spacecraft into an asteroid, yes, it is a very energetic event, but it's actually the momentum transfer that you're interested in. But yes, you know, you might say if you had a spacecraft sitting on the surface of an asteroid and firing its engines, wouldn't that give the same amount of momentum transfer as a spacecraft sitting out here and then accelerating into it and hitting it? Yes, those would be functionally the same in terms of momentum transfer, except that if you have something that comes in very fast and hits the surface, it's like an energetic explosion. So that actually blows more material off and that material will also carry away momentum. So you will actually have slightly more or or in the worst case scenario, you might have less, right? You might have a shockwave that transmits through the asteroid and blows stuff off the other side. This is why DART is doing this, is because you want to actually understand this effect on a real asteroid. There is another factor in that these are objects that are in orbit, and the velocity with which it leaves the Earth and arrives at the asteroid isn't necessarily the same as the amount of delta V that it's getting from this uh, you know, rocket from the engine. It's using a, an ion thruster to get there. So you can actually pick your orbital geometry and encounter geometry to maximize your impact velocity. And you might actually do better than a simple rocket engine burning on the surface. Adam Clark, remembering classic Apollo stage separation while watching DART and wondered why Apollo jettisoned the second stage engine skirt separately from the first stage. Modern stacks seem to have the engine skirts built into the first stage. Why did that change? So. Uh, yeah, you've seen the footage, you have the stage separation, and then a few seconds later, this like ring-shaped thing falls away, and it looks amazing. It's one of the most, you know, iconic pieces of space footage. I think the reason why these separated separately was because they have the ullage thrusters in there. They have stage separation thrusters that push the upper stage forward to provide continuous thrust while the engines ignite, because they need to have head pressure to do that, or they need to have you know the fuel sitting at the bottom. Um, and so once those engines are fired, they're little like solid motors that are in there, those would get jettisoned because you don't want to carry that mass all the way to orbit. Yeah, if you like questions like this, there is a fantastic the Haynes manual, the owner manual for the Saturn V. I've got it up there. Highly recommend reading it. It's a great book. Kirby W. Cartwright, have I read Termination Shock? It has an interesting take on using a space gun. It's worth a read. I haven't read Termination Shock, but as I understand, it's um, about a big part of it is geoengineering, environmental engineering, where they're you know, blowing stuff up into the upper atmosphere to you know, change the climate and try to you know, fix things and possibly cause other things as a result. Um, but yes, I, I, I do certainly know about this principle. Obviously, uh, one of the things that can affect climate is uh, like volcanoes which blow stuff up into the upper atmosphere. And there's certainly um, people that say, well, we could replicate this with space guns by throwing stuff up into the upper atmosphere. But as it's well known, volcanoes are but a small part driving things. I mean, they can be a big part, but generally over the last, you know, ten, <laughs> I don't know, very long period of time, they generally don't drive the climate for very long. And, and so... Anyway, um, haven't read that. Would like to maybe have the time. Oh God, I would love to have time to read things. Wouldn't that be great? Spare time between making videos and, you know, learning to fly and having a day job and taking care of the kids. Okay, so next one is Fred the Bulldog. He's, Hello, it's Gabriel Afana here. Why did you call yourself Fred the Bulldog? Okay, two questions for you. Two, oh goodness. Uh, are there any good books or documentaries that provide an inside look at the Soviet side of the space race? Yes, so there's two things I would recommend watching. One is 
Horizon had, or Nova, it's Red Star on Orbit. Now, may not be available through legal channels, but I'm sure you can find it online. This is three separate episodes, and they basically hang out with, uh, you know, Alexei Leonov. They talk about, you know, previous space work, and they talk about, you know, future space work. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. There's a lot of archive footage I haven't seen elsewhere. But if you want a first-hand account of the er, large parts of the space program, Boris Chertok wrote a series of books called Rockets and People, and they've been translated into English. They are an excellent first-hand account of many of the formative moments of the Soviet space program. Question number two. Being that weight was such a major issue during the development of the Saturn V, how did they manage to add a rover in the last three missions? They were able to add a rover because they optimized many things. First of all, they did expand the propellant tanks in the lunar lander, so they had a bit more performance there. But they also used the command module to place the lunar module into a lower orbit uh, before separating, so then it wouldn't have to perform as much of a deorbit burn. So they were able to get more performance out of these later missions and carry along the rover. The rover was only like a, you know, 200 kilograms, right? It was a very lightweight piece of hardware. But, uh, you know, it's still, the more, the hard thing with the rover was just to fold it up into that tiny amount of space. That was some amazing work there. Daryl Nelson, with a uh, James Webb in space, hopefully in a few weeks, yes, again, uh, I can confirm now from the future that it is indeed in space and everything has gone right. If something goes wrong, there is no shuttle that could fix it. Now there's talk it could take 40 years before a craft is built that could fix it. We have Dragon plus Artemis. Why cannot they be used to send someone? I'm available to go out to James Webb. I'm available too. So look, first of all, there was early on NASA committed to including like a docking or grasp adapter so that a spacecraft could go up to it. I think that was quietly dropped at some point. Basically, yeah, you've got a the telescope, and the main thing is on one side you've got the sun shield, which is incredibly fragile, and you would not want a spacecraft flying around near that, firing its thrusters. And so once you dock onto it, well, assuming you can fix something on this site, that's still going to be an incredibly difficult experience. You can't go around the other side because you can't see anything and everything has to be kept cold. And again, you have this incredibly fragile sun shield. It is just a thing for which it would be much easier to just build another JWST and fix the problems. Trevor McMillan. Hi, Scott. My brother and I are big fans of your channel. Thanks for everything you do. Thank you for thanking me. Why is it that we can hear the tumble, turbo pump pumps power up on the KSLV-2, but not on any other rockets? Actually, you can hear that on quite a few other rockets. It, it's just normally it's very hard to hear because you typically don't have sound in the area. But the most obvious rocket where you hear the turbo pumps start up is the, the Titan, right? The Titan that carried the Gemini. Just before it launched, you would hear this like whoop sound. One, zero. And what that was, was a solid rocket motor which would fire in, into, the, uh, into the gas generator turbines and spin those up, basically spin up the pumps so that they could start pumping the fuel and driving the gas generator. Um, that was one really obvious example where you can hear them. But there's also a few cases where, you know, in tests, there's a, at least one video, I think, where you can hear the turbine spinning up on a, an F1 engine on a Saturn, you know, Saturn V test. And also, there's in-flight video and audio, I believe from a Delta, a Delta IV, where there's a stage separation and you can hear after the, uh, you know, this is a Delta IV Heavy and you have after the two, you know, side boosters fall off and you can distinctly hear the turbo pumps on the center stage throttle up. So yes, you can hear it. It's just very hard because you've got this giant big rocket thruster making lots of noise at the same time. David Stanaway, question for you. 
For rendezvous with the ISS, is there a consistent procedural set of phasing manoeuvres used by all vehicles? Or does each vehicle have a unique set of manoeuvres they go through to get to the start point of their docking manoeuvre? Yeah, they tend to actually do their own things differently, but NASA's mechanism is a series of co-elliptic phasing manoeuvres where they essentially have an orbit which is like below the space station by a specific amount. But since the space station is in a slightly elliptical orbit, they make sure that it actually matches the eccentricity and the orientation of that. So they will go into these and then when they get to within, I think when the horizontal distance along the orbit, the lag has to be a factor of seven or thereabouts, I believe. They, they boost up and that then brings them to a point just below the space station and then they fire their engines again. But yeah, the co-elliptic phasing maneuvers are consistent across all NASA vehicles. Now, as distinct, once you get to the space station, all the US spacecraft tend to approach from below the space station and then uh, fire their engines to you know accelerate and remain roughly below the station. From there, they need to perform what's called proximity operations where they maneuver around the space station. And normally in the US, they will maneuver to the front of the station. Now to do that, they have to be, uh, they have to actually fire their engines so they go forwards, but because they're going forwards, they will start to rise up in the orbit and reach this point here where they're now close to their apogee. And again, they need to fire their engines a little to hit this you know, target point just in front of the station. Similarly, they can perform an orbit around to the top and it's an eccentric kind of orbit, right? Because the lateral variation during a slightly eccentric orbit is slightly higher. It's not a circle, it's more like an ellipse where they'll go out in front of the station and come out over the top. That's what happened on the most two, uh, two most recent Dragon operations. And once they're there, then they come down. Um, yeah, proximity operations is one of these things that's actually surprisingly complicated. Uh, okay, F wait, wait, Fred the Bulldog's asking another question. I should have caught this before I made these questions. Oh, betrayed. That's three questions, I think. Hello, during the Apollo missions, they used inertial guidance to keep track of spaceship's location and direction in space. However, they routinely required recalibration by the astronauts. Is inertial guidance still the industry standard for modern spacecraft and probes? If so, do they magically calibrate them remotely or are they accurate now that they remain true after years in space? What has happened essentially is the inertial guidance is still very much used, but it is recalibrated automatically by ship systems, right? Um, or it's recalibrated by people on the ground taking readings and measurements and then applying that back to the system. So yeah, the spacecraft will have accelerometers on board, but mostly they don't register anything unless a, an engine burn is happening. So uh, like in aircraft, by the way, we, one, of the, one of the instruments you'll have in older aircraft that have like the six pack of you know, steam gauges is you'll have your horizontal uh, you know, direction indicator. And that is like a compass. That's what you tend to use for all your maneuvers, but you'll have a magnetic compass. This horizontal indicator is, uh, it's a gyroscope driven device and it will drift from the magnetic orientation. So you need to reset that every 15 minutes or so to line up with the compass. But on the modern aircraft that I'm flying, the Cirrus, this is all like, uh, it's all, you know, it, it's all solid state, it's all electronics, it's using, you know, accelerometers, gyroscopes, it's using GPS, and it's using whole other information out there. And it's of course using the pedostatic system. It's combining all that information and it's doing the corrections and everything for you. And it's generate when it displays a compass, it's displaying, you know, its corrected version at all times. So yeah, what's really happened is that the crew on board don't need to do these kind of corrections at this time. There are sensors that do it automatically. In this, you know, in the Apollo spacecraft, they actually had like a little sighting telescope that they could use to sight the stars and read them off. And that was very important for figuring out the spacecraft's orientation. They would also perform like timing measurements as they moved over the moon so that they could correctly calibrate their orbit. But uh, yeah, that none of that stuff needs to be done by astronauts right now. Although I'm going to say it would be fun to have a chance to try to do that and compare it against the computer. Paul Budrett, a Brun, Brun, Brundrett. Ooh, that's an interesting sound of it. Boy, it sounds good when I say it with my Scottish accent, doesn't it? 
Hi, Scott. I have just finished rereading The Fountains of Paradise by Arthur C. Clarke, which is centered around the concept of space elevator. Is this actually possible given the right materials funds, or is there just a fundamental physical reason why it could never work? So, uh, if you're if you're interested in fiction surrounding space elevators, another one to read is the web between worlds, and I forget who wrote it, but he had an appendix. I remember getting this out of the library, and this was like a this was a major moment for me, me becoming a space nerd because I realized that you could use like physics and math to actually write science fiction. And so he has an appendix where he actually formulates what it would take to build like uh, a tower that could go, a space elevator that could go from the equator up well above geostationary orbit and be balanced. And so what you're really interested in is a material with the highest strength to weight ratio. And it turns out that there's nothing, there's no material that allows you to have a tower like this without having it taper. So it has to start out very narrow and get thicker and thicker to support the extra mass below it. And when it reaches geostationary orbit, that's the point of peak stress and then it can start you know, tapering off to the furthest point. So he actually had a table at the back of the book with uh, different materials and different taper factors that would be required. So yeah, if you can get perfect you know, dislocation-free carbon nanotubes, then it is a reasonable thing to do. But you have to understand that on top of just having the structural material, if you're going to make your tower useful, you also be able to have to be able to add like power cables, rails that things attach to. And these may not be contributing to the strength of holding the tower up. So look, there's nothing that stops it happening but it might just be that the Earth is a bit too big and rotates a bit too slowly to make this a reasonable proposition. However, it is certainly doable on many other planets which have lower gravities and you know, um, you know are relevant spin rates. And a great example, I think Mars is much, much easier because the planet is smaller and the rotation rate is roughly that of the Earth. Uh, some of the moons around Jupiter, for example, also would be a problem. So you might see space elevators in the future, not necessarily on Earth. And by the way, I think uh, the book, the, the the Web Between Worlds, what they used for a space elevator was like uh, a carbon with nitrogen filament of some sort. And the other problem, by the way, is that, you know, you can make these very strong carbon nanofibers in like a lab. To make a space elevator, you have to be able to grow hundreds of thousands of kilometers off them. And, you know, if you could grow them at, you know, a meter per day, it would still take you a very long time, right? If you could grow them at a meter per second, it would still take, you you know, 100, 200 days to grow this thing out, right? It is hugely, um, yeah, it's it's a huge, um, you know, difficult structural problem to solve, but it's not strictly speaking, impossible. Chris K. Hello. I started wondering what the gas mix inside the fairing is and if the launch providers fiddle with it. Falcon 9 has 146 cubic meters, which should weigh 177 kilograms when filled with air, but only 26 filled with helium. A hefty difference of 150 kilograms. You are absolutely correct. However, no, they don't tend to do this. But when a spacecraft is sitting in the fairing, typically waiting to be launched, it is quite common that part of the launch umbilicals will include um, like air conditioning for this, just to blow in dry, you know, nitrogen. You basically take the oxygen out. Typically, they blow in dry nitrogen, and that stops condensation forming inside the fairing, which would be a bigger deal because that can form ice. But as the spacecraft rises off, uh, you know, and goes up the air pressure outside goes down. So the air, the gas inside actually has to leave it. Otherwise, what will happen is the air pressure inside will get too high and the thing will pop open, which is not good. So yeah, the, the gas is designed to come out during the early part of the flight. And the mass saving of 150 kilograms isn't actually that much when you're looking at the booster. It might be significant when you're looking at the final stage, but by that point, you've already ditched the fairing, so it's not really that much of a gain. So yeah, you do need to have air conditioning and other environmental stuff to make sure your satellites are kept in a good shape. Oh, another example, by the way, would be if you have 
a spacecraft with a radioisotope thermoelectric generator, that needs special cooling because that thing is generating a lot of heat and you need to keep it at a reasonable temperature. Okay, Adam Silkett. Hi Scott, do you think the Space Shuttle program might have been more successful if they didn't need, hadn't needed to change the design based on military requirements? I have two conflicting thoughts about this. Before the ISS, it was both the Transport 2 and the Destination in orbit, so maybe it was good that it was bigger than originally intended, given all the roles it needed to fill. Two, if it had been smaller and simpler, it might have lowered the cost of launching and maintaining it, reducing accidents and left more budget for expansion into space. The latter is just supposition though. I'm wondering what your thoughts are. So strictly speaking, uh, if they had a smaller space shuttle, for example, right, so yeah, the space shuttle, one of the deals was the cargo bay was constrained by you know, US military requirements that they wanted. They want to get every part of the government signed on to work with a space shuttle. So they gave it this big payload bay. And NASA was quite happy to have a big payload bay because it let them do a lot of other things that they might not have been able to do. But say they had developed a much smaller space shuttle, when the space station came around, uh, they could have still launched lots of the, um, the modules on rockets and have them you know, be met in space by the space shuttle and carried, or they could just dock autonomously. It would probably change the design of the space station significantly, but uh, it might also have meant the space shuttle didn't, the space station didn't happen. So look, yes, yeah, space shuttle would have been different. I can't say it would necessarily have been more expensive. Uh, I think the problems that the space shuttle had was largely more down to design by committee rather than anything. And sure, you can blame, you can say, oh, the military wanted this one orbit rendezvous thing and we worked really hard to develop it and they never used it. Um, yes, but from that, other capabilities arose, which were able to be used by the space shuttle. So yeah, it was just that the vehicle, as it was required, tried to make everybody happy, and it didn't necessarily. It wasn't ever going to necessarily make everybody happy. There was always going to be compromises for some group or the other, and the military were quite happy to drop out when they had the chance. They didn't want to have astronauts on their rockets that were launching super secret um, satellites. Why do that when you could just have a satellite launched on a rocket and nobody on it, right? So anyway, yes, I, I think I'm going to stop there <laughs> and we'll come back next month or maybe, so maybe sooner than that. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.